Earlier this month, Eliud Kipchoge became the first person to run a marathon in under two hours. Absolutely incredible. I can't even imagine running a mile at the pace that he runs a full marathon. Now, in this video, I want to look at five things that we can all learn from looking at his running form to help us all become better runners. So the first thing I want to focus on is Kipchoge's foot strike. We're going to take a look and see how his foot comes and strikes the ground. We can see that as his foot meets the ground, he's landing with the balls of his feet, but doing so with a light midfoot strike, rather than landing right up in more of a kind of a forefoot striking position running on his toes, as we'd expect to see from a sprinter perhaps. Landing with a midfoot strike here allows him to keep contact time nice and short, keep the limb stiffness, which is something we'll talk about a little bit later, nice and firm, so that he actually manages to maximize the elastic return off the ground with each stride. We can see as we come forwards frame by frame onto the next foot, we can see that as he lands this right foot again, it's very much midfoot, so balls of the feet land first, almost, almost at the same time that the rest of the foot comes down flat to the ground. He's certainly not keeping his heel off the ground as we see from sprinters, and he's certainly not doing what we see from so many recreational runners, which is landing with his heel first, landing with more of a, a heel strike or a rear foot striking pattern. In fact, what we see here from Shura Katata, the runner behind him, also a fantastic runner, finished this race that we've actually got on footage here, which is London Marathon 2019, finished in fourth, uh, 2.05.01, so again, very fast, but we can see the difference in running technique here, overstriding, heel strike. Which brings me on to the next point, which is stride length. Okay, so no matter what pace you're running, the real key is to make sure that you can create the stride length you need to run that pace, so the ground coverage that you need to run at that pace without overstriding, without landing that foot ahead of a more extended knee, therefore too far ahead of your center of mass. Kipchoge here, as we can see as he strikes the ground, manages to do so with his ankle underneath a flexing knee. A okay, lovely example of what we want to see from a distance runner in terms of maintaining stride length without overstriding. It's when we start to see people landing ahead of a more extended knee. So again, we're going to pick on Katata here behind him, landing ahead of a more extended knee here. So rather than the shin being vertical, we've got this forward alignment of the shin. This is what we don't want to see. In this kind of position, this is where we start to see effectively the brakes being slammed on stride by stride, with his center of mass obviously moving forwards, landing the foot significantly ahead of his center of mass, ahead of a more extended knee, means that there's gonna be more decelerative force that the body needs to deal with before it can move on to the next stride, which is gonna result in more impact on the ankle, the knee, the hip, and further up the chain. Coming back to Kipchoge here in the white, we can see that in comparison, as that foot strikes the ground, the shin is vertical, if not slightly you know, backwards facing, and therefore allows the knee to act as it should do as this little shock absorber to help perpetuate this forward motion as the foot passes underneath the body and allows him to push off. Now, we know that these guys have looked at various different bits of race footage and cadence does vary depending on where in the race they are, depending on what pace they're running, cadence is variable, but one constant is they're all around about the 180 steps per minute mark. My third point is cadence and the importance of keeping it elevated to the point where you don't need to overstride to overcome a slightly too low cadence, which is what we see from lots of recreational runners out there. So the point I want to make around cadence is how it actually affects contact time and limb stiffness. But before we get there, it's important to appreciate that stride length and cadence work together. If you're not able to maintain a high enough, pace, uh, high enough cadence for the given pace, the only way you can maintain the given pace is to increase your stride length. So what we see here from Kipchoge with his cadence up around about the 180 steps per minute mark is that he's not having to overstride to overcome that. Katata, in comparison, 
okay, gives a good example of one of the strategies that we see from a lot of runners who do run with too low of a cadence. They end up throwing that lower leg too far in front of themselves as we discussed a minute ago. Okay, now, one of the important points around cadence is that by keeping a quick cadence and by maintaining a short enough stride in relation to center of mass, so not over striding, it means that you can land that foot in a position where with a light little midfoot strike, or again, you can do this with a, a, a gentle heel strike rather than over striding heel strike. If you're a heel striking runner, not to say that heel striking is bad, it's the over striding heel strike we don't want. You're able to keep contact time nice and short. Okay, you're able to minimize the amount of time the foot is on the ground. And as we keep the contact time short, what we experience is an increase in limb stiffness. This point where the foot is underneath the hip here. This is mid stance, and this is the point where your center of mass is gonna be at its lowest. Whether you're Kipchoge, or whether you're someone who's just started running, doesn't matter, it's true for all of us. At this point, this is where your center of mass is gonna be held at its lowest, because this is the point where we're going to be maximally, or, or at the peak amount of knee flexion um, that we see during stance phase. Now, with a short contact time and a more stiff standing supporting limb, we see less knee flexion here from Kipchoge than we see from Katata. Now let's have a look with his long overstriding heel strike. The amount, in fact, let's just come back to a previous stride. Here we go, let's come through and look at uh, Katata's right leg as it comes through and makes contact with the ground. Now, as he comes through stance phase, I would argue that the amount of knee flexion here is more than we see during mid stance from Kipchoge here. And Kipchoge therefore is able to maintain a, a better degree of, think of it as energy transfer. Okay, think of it as elastic recoil with that shorter contact time on the ground to help him explode off the ground with this powerful stride, this powerful back end of his stance phase to push him off onto the next stride. Now, with that increase in terms of release of, um, release of potential energy, release of stored energy, that comes with that more stiff limb, he manages to then spring onto the next stride without having to overreach and overstride. Whereas we see with Kitata here, knowing that as he comes through, makes contact with the ground, sinks his center of mass lower, deeper, into a more knee flex position, he has to push off harder out of this deeper position and this more knee flex position, which, means that he's not going to get quite as much of that elastic recoil to actually spring onto the next stride, which means that the only way he can make up that loss in stride length is again over striding, reaching out ahead of himself. Okay, so it's the degree of stiffness, the degree of elastic recoil that Kipchoge manages to actually achieve that helps him maintain this light, relaxed, smooth running form. Okay, so the next point I want to make actually centers around upper body carriage. Okay, we're going to play this through slowly and we can see that there is a degree of rotation from Kipchoge. We can see his hand there coming across towards the midline, probably more so, just eyeballing it here, more so the right coming across towards the midline than the left, but they both are, they're not crossing the midline. Okay, it's not this uncontrolled rotation we see from some people. But what we see is this relaxed rotation which allows him to actually work in counter rotation to what his pelvis is doing. So as his pelvis rotates right, left, right, left, his upper body is going to be rotating left, right, left, right, meaning that he actually starts to again store the potential energy through structures that we sometimes refer to as the anterior oblique sling. So if we think about as the hips coming back on this side, pelvis is rotating around this way, his torso is rotating around this way, he's going to be getting a lengthening of tissues. You can almost see the, the indicative kind of creasing in his top here, but lengthening of tissues on this kind of spiraling line across the front meaning that then as he comes through swing phase, he's gonna get that release of that stored energy and 
here we're going to get the opposite. So as he's driving back with the elbow here, rotating his torso around this way, his pelvis is rotating around this way, and he's going to be getting the opposite effect. Okay, he was, with this relaxed rotation, he's kind of using this rotational winding up almost of tension through his torso to allow him to release that potential energy from stride to stride. I actually went into that in more depth in a video um, about Shalane Flanagan, which I'll leave a link to down in the description. Okay, and the last point I want just to observe really more than anything else is just how relaxed he looks. Okay, he's clearly moving at a hell of a pace here. Um, a pace, as I said in the intro, that most of us can only dream of. But he's not looking like he's fighting himself. He looks nice and relaxed through his shoulders. His hands are relaxed. His face is relaxed. And he's allowing himself to get into this kind of flow state that I think a lot of us could just do with working on. If you're looking at finding ways to improve your running technique, I'd suggest starting with the video up here, which will talk a little bit more about your stride pattern and how to improve that. And if you're interested specifically on how to increase your cadence, check out this video, which will take you through the process of doing exactly that. Okay, I'll speak to you soon. Enjoy your running. Take care. Bye now.